Well, welcome to Calvary Church at Home and our online lobby. It is so good to be with you today. It is a special Sunday. It is Palm Sunday, the start of Passion Week uh, as we lead next week to what Christian faith is all centered around the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. On Easter Sunday, we're happy you're here. My name is Nate. This is my wife, Janae, and we're so pumped to be your host today. Yes, and we're so excited that you have decided to join us, but we'd like to encourage you to invite others, whether that is through YouTube or Facebook or our calvarynm.church URL that you can join in right now. Go ahead and text that or send that to somebody um, so they can join you. That's right. Again, if you're on Facebook or YouTube, it's so easy. Just click that share button and uh, it'll pop up. So simple for you to invite some more friends to join us. Um, And as we just said, this is the start of Passion Week and next week is Good Friday and Easter. And we have so many opportunities for you to join us and celebrate what our Christian faith is centered upon, the death and resurrection of Christ. We hope that you plan to join us. If you join us in person, even better. Uh, Or of course, you can join us online for all of our service times. Let's do a quick rundown of that. What do we got going on? Good Friday. Good Friday. We have a 12 noon uh, service that will be out in the amphitheater of our campus. And then a 630 evening service that will be hosted in the amphitheater, or sorry, sanctuary. (laughs) And then for uh, Easter, we have our sunrise service. I'm so excited about that. That will, uh, doors open at 630. So if you're here locally. At UNM Stadium, the Lobo Stadium football team stadium. Which is kind of like become our our stadium. That's right. (laughs) And then um, it starts at 7.30. Then we have our 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. here at Osuna as well. That's as well right. As our all, other those, all those opportunities are live online, but they're also live in person. We encourage you to make your way out here if you live in the New Mexico mm-hmm. area or yeah. maybe you live just outside of New Mexico and you want to make the trek and do something special for Easter. Come join us, especially that Easter sunrise service is so special. There is yeah. nothing like being with 20,000 believers on Easter morning as the sun rises and proclaims praises to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you've never been a part of it, it is exhilarating. We would love to see you out there for that. Uh, You can get all the details at easterabq.com. On Good Friday, we also do something special. We always say uh, that blood saves lives. That's right. Um, The blood of Christ is what saves our lives spiritually, but our blood physically can save someone else's life. And uh, we emulate Christ when we sacrifice ourselves for other people. And so every year for Good Friday, we have a blood drive that happens in our East parking lot. Uh, We encourage you to come by. You can sign up online, easterabq.com. You can get all the details, service times, locations, sign up for the blood drive. There's social media things that you can share on there to your friends. So check it out, easterabq.com. Com. That's right. Last year we did 82 units um, for our blood drive. So I want to challenge you and those who are here to, to go beyond that because blood does save lives right. and this is a sacrifice you can make and, and an outreach opportunity that doesn't take too much effort on your part. Just a That's little right. bit of sacrifice. So. Hey, you've heard us talk about the past couple weeks. Our vision for 2024 mm-hmm. is to make more room. I love We've been it. in this series, In the Room, talking about the importance of being with other people. It's less about the actual room we're in, it's more about the people who are in the room right. with us. And so for 2024, our vision is to make more room. We have hundreds of thousands of people who watch online and join us mm-hmm. and see our services. And we would love to give those of you who are watching online an opportunity to give in the room yeah. with other believers. Uh, and so we have an aggressive uh, campus launch strategy for 2024. We want to see at the end of this year 12 campuses in 12 different locations right. around the world. We've got our eyes on a few cities, um, and you're going to hear more about some of those cities in our Vision Weekend, which is the week after Easter. It's going to be a really special weekend talking about our 2024 vision and our heart. And uh, we're going to do a little bit of trivia right now. <laughs> and walk through some facts. About uh, a city. And we're gonna see if you can tell us which city we're talking about. This is a city we have our eyes set on. We're planning on launching a campus there this year, and it's one that I am especially excited about, (laughs) getting an opportunity to go there hopefully a few times each year. So we're gonna ask the questions to you and see if you can guess it. And in the end, we're just gonna give you the answer if you couldn't guess it. So right now in the chat. And answer in the chat, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is interactive, all right? I wanna know what you're guessing. All right, this is interactive. So this city, this is, this is surprising actually. This city has more barbecue restaurants 
per capita than any other U.S. city. How do you feel about that? When I read that, I was actually surprised. Does it make you excited that that's what let's it just is? Maybe, let's, maybe let's go broader. Let's go state. What state do you think has the most barbecue? This city has more barbecue restaurants per capita than any other U.S. city. What, what state do you think that U.S. city would be in? Right. I think probably automatically we would say Texas. Barbecue? Barbecue. Maybe? I think Texas. People would say, oh, Texas. It's got to be Texas. Barbecue just always seems south. It's good old it country be... boys. They're going to shoot things and cook it and barbecue. <laughs> and, right? Yeah. I just think the south in general. So that's, there's a variety there that All you right, could Maybe Tennessee. Sh- maybe yeah. you'd be like, oh, Tennessee maybe is the answer. All right, let's yeah. narrow it down. This is, uh, this is also surprising. This city was the birthplace okay. of Mickey Mouse. Oh, that's a good one. I didn't know that. See, now it throws you for a curve. Now you're like, all right, I thought Texas maybe with the barbecue. Now Mickey Mouse, I'm thinking California, right? Disneyland. Right, right. Walt Disney. Right. But I'm, I can't wow. I can't see Anaheim as being the, no. the biggest barbecue place and in the country. And I live there. It's definitely not the biggest barbecue so place. Let us they know, have barbecue, let but Let us know you, what your thoughts, what your guesses are right now in the chat. Um, this is a fun one. The Happy Meal was invented in this city. Wow. I used to love getting Happy okay, Meals when I was a kid, kid right? Okay, you love this city. You love Happy, Happy Meals. Meals. Mickey, Mickey Mouse. Mouse barbecue. <laughs> barbecue. That's always Happy safe Meals. For says Bob Bernstein, <laughs> founder of the local advertising agency Bernstein Rhine, got the idea after noticing his son staring at a cereal box during breakfast. Okay, oh. now we're going to move on to the fourth question. This city, this is so interesting. This I can't believe this is question? all in one city. This city is known for its rich history of jazz. And you can hear it today when you hang out. This should be a big, big hint for people around 18th and Vine. Jazz. They're supposed to know the streets. So again, jazz, now I'd be thinking like New Orleans. Now I'd be thinking Louisiana. Yeah, that's where I would have jumped. Or I'd go to a big city like Chicago or New York. Okay, yeah. So now I'm like, okay, is it California? Is it Texas? Is but it, the best barbecue... Is it New Orleans? It's taking you all over the map. I don't know what to tell Louisiana, you. Louisiana, I still feel like, is a safe bet because I'm thinking it's barbecue, south, Louisiana, barbecue. Yep. But south. But it would probably be gumbo. Mickey Mouse, because you go to Disneyland, they have that whole New Orleans square and it's all about oh, Louisiana, true. the bayou. So I'm thinking, I'm leaning heavily Princess towards Louisiana right now, there. right? <laughs> I'm thinking Louisiana maybe okay. right now because it's got the barbecue, it's got the jazz. Mm-hmm. Uh, it makes sense. Mickey Mouse, there's a tie in there to Disneyland. All right, here we go. Someone for sure knows. Someone's going to answer the, the question. I think at this point, again, if someone gets it in the in the chat right now, ding, 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 you're a winner. Um, <laughs> if not, hopefully you'll get it in the next one. This city has over 200 fountains, giving it the nickname the City of Fountains. Oh, see, that doesn't help for me. I would have. I think of monuments, and I think of Washington D.C. And so I would, even though fountains aren't monuments, that's just where my head goes. That they would have had fountains there. Right. Okay, I'm going to give you one last question, and Janae, I think you're going to get it after this, all right? Okay. Let's see if the chat knows this. All right. The chat. The NFL football team that plays in this city has a, a breakout wide receiver rookie named Rashi Rice. Oh, that's not fair. I know that exactly. What is it? Kansas City. Kansas City! That's my team! Chiefs ooh, in ooh, the ooh. house! <laughs> I've actually got really, for this occasion right now. Oh, oh, oh. Here it comes. Come on. I got the Rashi Rice signed oh, jersey. Come on, look at that. Number four. I'm a huge, if you didn't know, you probably do. Janae and I are huge, huge Chiefs kids. fans. <laughs> we love the Chiefs. We love Kansas City. Shout out to our friends in Kansas City, Kyle and Liz Turner. That's right. Um, we love and, that. and we actually have a lot of people who watch and tune in online in Kansas City, Missouri. And so we have one couple who actually came and visited here from the Kansas City, Missouri area. Oh, and they expressed interest in launching a satellite campus in their city. So, That's so for cool. those of you watching online, if you're in Kansas City, let us know right now in the chat. Yeah. Say, hey, I'm from Kansas. You We'd love awesome to hear from you. Or maybe if you have friends or family in the Kansas City area, we are so excited. 2024, we want to launch a satellite campus in Kansas City. Janae and I want to come visit as often as we as can. As often as possible. To hang out and go Between see some Chiefs games. Between like September and February. That's right. I'm just kidding. So if you have friends or family in the Kansas City area or you yourself are in that area and you would like to be a part of getting updates on a Kansas City campus, you want to come to the launch party, you want to be a part of interest meetings, uh, you want to meet Pastor Skip, you want to meet some of the team, we would love to hear from you. You can go to calvarynm.church forward slash locations. Yes. On that page, there should be a little 
little icon for Kansas City. If you click that, you can sign up to get updates and get all the info on that campus launch. And we are so excited yes. to see that campus launch this year, as well as many, many others. We've got one launching in Great Malvern, England, actually on Easter wow. Sunday. So if you're in Great Malvern, England, check that out. That's on our website and so many more. There's this beautiful sense in the church that we can pool our resources together to serve one another. When I see a need, I meet a need. When I see a hurting brother or sister in Christ, I don't think about if I should do something, I do something. Because they're my brother, they're my sister. God is looking for people who are willing to just say yes. He's looking for people who are just willing to say, I don't really know what I'm going to do, but I'll give it a shot. I think God's waiting for us to answer the calling and then he'll do the equipping. We just got to be willing to say, you know what, Lord, I don't know what you want me to do, but yes, whatever it is, yes. One, two. Somebody said that parenting is just being a partner with God in discipling your children. The reason we think exposing people to truth is so important is because they're going to get exposed to non-truth so much out there, they need something to counteract. And the same with raising children. I've never met a person at the end of his life or her life who regrets being too spiritual, spending too much time with their family, praying too much, going to church and devoted to the things of the Lord too much. I've seen lots of regrets in the opposite direction, but never that. In the words of Jeremiah, uh, you know, he said, seek the good of the city to which you are called captive. We as the church are trying to attract people to Jesus Christ. If we don't integrate into the world system, being in the world but not of the world, there's not gonna be any way to really reach people for Christ. You gotta love the city so people you feel the hook. That's the hook of the gospel. People wanna feel and see the love. That becomes the hook that draws them where you as a fisher of men get to take the next step in evangelism. This place. These people. My privilege. 
We take ownership in loving, protecting, and serving our city with that heart. We love our families with that heart. We tune our hearts to the Lord in this place, and we worship the only one who is worthy.
of you know it's Palm Sunday weekend. And as we continue in worship, I wanted to read a scripture with you all. It's John 12, 13, and it says, so they took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And right now we're gonna take a moment to sing those very words, to sing Hosanna, to give all praise, glory, and honor to our King, amen. We invite you to sing this with us. The king of love had given up his life. The darkest day in history. There on a cross they made for sinners. For every curse his blood atoned. One final breath in it. For the earth began to shake, and the veil was torn. What sacrifice was made as a heaven rose?
on, church. Shout it out. Hosanna. Come on, shout it out. The Lord is in this place. It wasn't just 2,000 years ago. Can we say it together? Can we just close our eyes? Hosanna. Hosanna, Lord. Hosanna, for you alone are worthy of our honor, of praise, of the glory. We magnify your name, Jesus. You are the King of Kings. Not just 2,000 years ago, you're the King of our lives today, in this moment. You're the Lord of our lives. You're the Lord of this church. You're the Lord of this land. You're the Lord of this country, Lord. You reign supreme even when we can't see it, even when we can't feel it. You reign on the throne forevermore. Even when we deny you, even when our actions betray you, Lord, you are king. And we worship you and honor you as such. We sing Hosanna. We say King of Kings because 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem proclaiming himself king. And for 2,000 years since then, we join the saints in all of history proclaiming that he is the king of kings laying down our good works laying down our burdens laying down our shame laying down what we have and proclaiming hosanna and it feels good to say those words doesn't it feels good to acknowledge that we're not in control, that Jesus Christ is in control. But I find a lot of us don't have a problem saying those words, and yet our lives, we have a difficult time, we have a hard time letting God truly reign as the King of Kings within our life. We're happy to let God be our friend. We're happy to let God be our healer. We're happy to let Jesus come in and be our fixer to be our ever-present help in time of need. But a lot of times we don't wanna let Jesus sit on the throne of our lives and our hearts. We don't wanna give up those things that we've been holding on to. We don't wanna humbly lay ourselves down and admit that we don't have the strength and we don't have the power. But that's what this weekend is all about. It's about professing not just with our words, but our hearts and laying our hearts low and professing that he is the King of Kings. So we're gonna sing this song again. We're gonna sing all hail King Jesus. But I challenge you as you do, don't just let it be the words that you say. Let it be a position of your heart. Let it be a position of your soul as you humble yourselves. You know that's why we raise our hands. We don't do it to like touch heaven and touch God. We, we raise our hands, we get on our knees like a, a poor beggar, like a peasant saying, Lord, I can't do anything without you. We humble ourselves, we humble our hearts and we say, Hosanna, Hosanna, praise you, King Jesus. Sit on the throne of our hearts and our lives and rule and reign supreme. So church, can we do that? Can we lift our hands in submission right now? Can we think about the areas in our lives where we haven't allowed the Lord to rule and reign, the things we're holding on to, the things we're keeping back? Can we lay them at the feet of Jesus like palm branches and say, all hail King Jesus? Come on, let's sing it together, church. your name. How good it is to be in your presence, Lord. And yet none of us deserve it. So Lord, we don't come with a haughty spirit. We don't come prideful. We come 
Lord, as beggars, destitute without you, thankful that you're ruling and reigning, that you are king and you're a good king. Lord, we come with the heart of just one beggar telling another beggar to get some food. Lord, we pray that you would sit on the throne, your rightful throne, Lord, that we would allow you that role within our lives, in every area of our life. We would submit to your will, trusting that it is good and it is perfect, trusting that you have a purpose and a plan, trusting that you know better than we do, giving you our all, our good, our bad, all of it, Lord, we give it to you. We lay it at your feet. Rule in our lives, Jesus. In your name we pray and all God's people said, amen, amen. Church, you can have a seat. How good is it worshiping today, church? So good acknowledging the place of Jesus Christ in our lives. Welcome to Calvary. It is the start of Passion Week as we celebrate Palm Sunday this weekend. And then, of course, on Friday, celebrating not just a good Friday, a great Friday, right? That our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. There is nothing else that can cover that. And then, of course, Sunday, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is it, guys. This is Super Bowl week for Christians, and we're happy that you're here. And for a little bit of info about Good Friday, about Easter Sunday, let's take a look at some church news to hear all the details. Hey church, enjoying worship in God's word is one big family so encouraging. And we hope you'll take that to the next level at a connect group. And we're thrilled to share that we have 29 new connect groups getting ready to welcome you. In addition to that, the many open groups that are already running. So we can't wait to connect with you. So please explore your connect group options online and make a plan to connect this week. We're counting the days till we celebrate Easter with you next weekend. Join us at our Osuna campus on Good Friday at noon or at 6.30 p.m. for worship, communion, and a message from Pastor Skip. We'll also be hosting a Good Friday blood drive here at our Osuna campus from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Blood saves lives, so register online today. Then, on Sunday, we'll kick off our resurrection celebration with New Mexico's biggest sunrise service at 7.30 a.m. at UNM Stadium. We'll worship with Austin French and Calvary Worship and hear a word from Pastor Skip, followed by additional Easter morning services at all our campuses. We'll have fun family activities like Easter egg hunts at Osuna and Westside. Full event details are online for all our campuses, so make plans to join us. And ask the Lord who to invite. Don't forget friends, family, and people you see during the week. Invite everyone and bring someone. We're preparing for an incredible weekend of worship and celebration, so there won't be a Wednesday or Saturday service this week. And this is the last weekend to sign up to serve at our Easter services at the stadium or on campus. Visit the events page to sign up. Hey, good morning, Calvary Church at Home. We're so happy that you're joining us for the start of Easter week. Happy Palm Sunday to you. It was great worshiping just a minute ago and singing Hosanna to Jesus as we remember that 2,000 years ago, he rode into Jerusalem declaring that he is king. And so today we worship him as king. That's right. And in just a minute, we're going to go ahead and hear a message from Pastor Skip about just that. But first, we'd like to take a moment and welcome you today. If it's your first time, we would love to chat with you. We would love for you to reach out in the chat next to this video where you will be able to connect with our team. And also, we'd love to get a gift in your hands. So if you are new right now, say I'm new in that chat and we'll reach out to you. And don't just tell us that you're new. Tell us where you're from. We That's always good. love seeing people all across the world join us for Calvary Church here in America, but all across the globe. We have people watching right now in Cape Town, South Africa, in Great Malvern, England, across uh, all parts of the UK, Europe, Asia, Australia, wherever you're joining us from. We're so happy that you're here, but I have a question for you. How would you like it if there was a campus in your city so that we could be with you in 
person. You might have heard before service us talking about Kansas City and the fact that we're looking to launch a campus there later this year. So if you're in the Kansas City area, Missouri or Kansas, and you're interested in being a part of that campus, let us know. There's a simple interest form that you can fill out at calvarynm.church forward slash locations. And if you're watching from another city and you'd like to bring a Calvary close to you, you can let us know at that same page. Again, that's calvarynm.church forward slash locations. That's right. And this is the start of what we as Christians call Passion Week, which means Mm. this Friday is Good Friday. As a matter of fact, it's a great Great Friday Friday because we get to celebrate (laughs) the fact that we have a Lord and Savior who died on the cross for our sins. No other religion can say that, that... What makes us unique is that Jesus Christ came to this earth, died Mm -hmm. on the cross for our sins, then rose again, and we get to celebrate all of that this week. So we're going to be having two services in person and online on Good Friday at 12 o'clock Mountain Standard Time and later that evening at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So if you're going to join online, prepare ahead, grab crackers and juice because we'll be taking communion together. We can't wait to see you there. And of course, following that, we have Easter Sunday, and all of our services are listed online. So whenever you're joining us, we're happy that you're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus with us. And of course, our guest artist, Austin French. It's going to be phenomenal. We're looking forward to Easter week. I want to remind you, as always, if you believe in the ministry of Calvary Church, you consider this your home. You join us each week. We're happy that you're part of the family, and you can give to what right. God is doing all around the globe by going to calvarynm.church forward slash give. Also want to remind you that we would love to pray with you and pray for you. So if there's something that you're experiencing in your life that you're carrying a heavy load, Mm, we encourage you to release it at the feet of Jesus today. Just type in the chat, I need prayer, and one of our team members would be happy to pray with you. Right now, grab your Bible. Here's Pastor Skip. I love oranges. <laughs> Would you please turn in your Bible to the uh, Gospel of John, chapter 12. Gospel of John, chapter 12. Some things in life are good. Other things in life are better. And then there are some things that are the best. If you go to school and you take um, a class and you get a C as your grade, well, that's good. That's average. If you get a B, that's better. If you get an A, that's the best. Um, if you get up in the morning and have a cup of coffee, that's good. Uh, if you have coffee with a cookie, better. that's better. <laughs> and if you do all that with your feet up, well, that's the best. <laughs> if you're in the backyard and you grill hamburgers, well, that's good. But if you add cheese to it, that's better. But what's best? Green chili with it. Green chili cheeseburger is best. Uh, If you watch the Super Bowl, I guess you could say, well, that's good. If you do it with a good food involved, that's better. If you have friends and family over while you do it, that's like the best. If your team wins, that's like the best of the best. Well, that's the title of this message, Good, Better, Best, because in John chapter 12, I want to show you three comparisons, three contrasts, three evaluations of one thing over another thing. One thing may be okay, may be the norm, may even be considered good, but something is clearly in comparison to that, the best And we're going to look at three of those. Now, this is what we have traditionally called Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the beginning of what is called in the church calendar Passion Week. Uh, Others call it Holy Week. It is from Palm Sunday to Easter. It's the final seven days of Jesus' life or six days of Jesus' life, the final let's say, 140 hours of Jesus' earthly life leading to the cross where he will give his life for the sins of the world. 
So today we're looking at a familiar passage in John chapter 12. Um, in our text on Good Friday, we're also going to be in John chapter 12. And on Easter Sunday, we'll also be in John chapter 12. I just thought that would be convenient. So uh, you can keep a marker here for the entire week. Palm Sunday is known for the time when Jesus came into the city. They waved palm branches toward him. They threw leafy branches and their clothing on the ground. Good Friday, we commemorate Jesus dying and being put in the ground. But then, of course, there's Easter where we celebrate with glad voices the fact that Jesus came up from the ground. He conquered death. And, and so we love this period of year, this time of year. We love celebrating it in all of its glory. Now, Passion Week takes up considerable space in the New Testament. It's estimated that two-fifths of Matthew, along with three-fifths of Mark, along with one-third of Luke, along with one-half of the Gospel of John, all of that is devoted to this final week of Jesus on the earth. In the four Gospels, there are only four chapters that cover the first 30 years of Jesus' life, only four chapters. There are 85 chapters devoted to the last three, three and a half years of Jesus' life. Of those 85 chapters, 29 of them are devoted to the final week, Passion Week, Holy Week. And Passion Week, Holy Week, begins with this event that we know so well, the triumphal entry, it has been called, of Jesus into Jerusalem on a donkey. It's one of the few events that all four gospel writers include. And that's noteworthy because not all of the events in Jesus' life is covered by every single author of the four gospels. Just select ones. His birth isn't even covered in all four Gospels. But certain things are, like the feeding of the 5,000. That's in all four Gospels. This event, the triumphal entry, of course, his crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection. Some key things. Four times the story is told in the Gospels. So I kind of think this, that if God repeats himself four times on any matter, it's pretty important. Sometimes there's a doubling. There's like, it's twice. Verily, verily. That's Jesus saying, listen up. This is important. This is true. Other times, there's a threefold repetition of something like, holy, holy, holy. Just to emphasize that that's God's principal characteristic. He is holy above all. But when God repeats himself four times, we are dealing with a significant event. Well, as you come to John chapter 12, and we're going to begin in just a minute in the 12th verse, we typically think that Palm Sunday happened on what day of the week? Sunday. After all, we call it Palm Sunday. But there is dispute in the chronology. Not everybody agrees with it being Sunday. Uh, some say it was Saturday. Others say it was Monday. And so... Um, then I guess it would be Palm Monday, but that doesn't sound right because we've had 2,000 years of calling it Palm Sunday. So let's just say that the event happened on Sunday. Let's not try to unwrap all the chronology because we have something more important in view. What is more significant than whether it was on Saturday, Sunday, or Monday is the fact that most scholars believe it happened in the Jewish calendar on the 10th day of the Hebrew month Nisan. Now, Nissan, 2,000 years ago, was not a make of car or truck. It was a month. The Jewish month of Nissan was Passover month. The 10th day of the Jewish month of Nissan was very significant in Judaism. That was the day the lamb was selected in the households to be sacrificed for the Passover. So it's significant that Jesus, the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world 
comes to Jerusalem to publicly be proclaimed as king. It's the only time he did. It's the only time he allowed it. It's the only time he allowed the public demonstration and declaration that he was indeed their Messiah and their king. Now, I've gone through this text many times with this church over the years. I've looked at it uh, prophetically, looking at all the different numbers from the book of Daniel and comparing that with the passages in the Gospels. Today, however, I don't want to go there. I really want to look at something more practical. Not the prophecy isn't practical. It certainly is. But I want to show you these three principles, three comparisons, three, let's call them discoveries for Palm Sunday. And as we go through each of the three, what I'd like you to do is evaluate your own life. By the way, you can only do that when you hear a sermon. You can't evaluate somebody else's life. Sometimes we try to do that. You think, oh, he needs to hear this. And we might nudge somebody or tell somebody later. But let's evaluate our own personal lives to see which of these we are. And here is the first comparison. And that is Jesus is more appealing than religion. Now that fact comes in bold relief as we read this passage of scripture because there's religious things going on and then Jesus shows up and he steals the show, so to speak. So let me take you to verse 12 of John chapter 12. The next day it says, a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. The whole context of this story is the context of religion. This is a religious event taking place in a religious city. The city of Jerusalem was the epicenter of Judaism. It's where the temple was. It was all built around the Jewish religion. So you have religious people in a religious city for a religious feast. The feast is Passover. You might know that there were three mandatory festivals, feasts, that Jews were required, every able-bodied Jew in the vicinities were required to go to Jerusalem for three times a year. Passover, Pesach, Pentecost, Shavuot, Tabernacles, Sukkot. Those were the three feasts. Usually people would come for Passover. They would often stay through till Pentecost, then they would go back home uh, for months before they went to the third feast. The Passover feast, the one we're dealing with here, saw the biggest crowds, the most people, because Passover was the focal point of Jewish history. They celebrated the deliverance out of Egypt under Moses. So they became a nation on Passover. It was so big that the normal population of the city of Jerusalem swelled we don't exactly know how big Jerusalem was 2,000 years ago. There's estimates between, let's say, 50 to 100,000 people lived there year-round. But at Passover time, the city swelled to at least 10 times that. So it was a massive convocation and congregation of people. But every year was the same. Every Passover was basically the same. People would travel the same roads. They would typically meet the same families. They would practice the same rituals. They would say the same prayers. They would sing the same songs. And people wanted more than whatever their religion was offering them. There was this messianic hunger anticipation that history says has been building among the Jewish people because they want something more. They want something more than endless rituals. They want something more than prescribed prayers. They want something more than anticipated ceremonies. They want something more than just the sacraments. 
One of my favorite little readings from Max Lucado is in one of his books, and it was called The Musings of a Shepherd. He, he pictures a shepherd uh, perched up on a little vantage point looking down uh, at the intersection of traffic coming into Jerusalem. And he writes this. He sits on a slope and places a blade of grass in his mouth. He looks beyond the flock at the road below. For over a week, a river of pilgrims has streamed through this valley, bustling down the road with animals and loaded with carts. For days, he has watched them from his perch. He knew where they were going and why. They were going to Jerusalem. And they were going to sacrifice lambs in the temple. The celebration strikes him as ironic. Streets jammed with people, marketplaces full of the sounds of the bleeding of goats and the selling of birds. Endless, endless observances. Yet the people relish the festivities. They awaken early and retire late. They find a strange fulfillment in the pageantry. But not him. He thinks, what kind of God would be appeased by the death of any animal? Oh, the shepherd's doubts are never voiced anywhere except on the hillside. But on this day, they shout. It isn't the slaughter of animals that disturbs him. It's the endlessness of it all. How many years has he seen people come and go? How many caravans? How many sacrifices? How many bloody carcasses? Lamb after lamb after lamb. Passover after Passover. He turns his head. He looks again at the sky. And he thinks, will the blood of yet another lamb really matter? I'm sure there were people that felt that about Passover. Every year they brought a lamb, and another lamb, and another lamb, and another lamb, and another year, and just the endless pageantry of it all. Will the death of another lamb really matter? No, not really, except the death of one lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's how a lot of people felt like this shepherd. They wanted more. They wanted they wanted reality. They didn't want religion. They wanted reality. I've always loved what John Wesley said. He said, I want my religion like I like my tea. I want it hot. Is that how you want it? You want it hot? You want it real? You want it authentic? Or, no, I, just lukewarm for me, please. Same old, same old. Nobody wants that. Well, verse 12 says that uh, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, everything changed when they heard that. That news made them pivot to the event that we read about. Why? Because now Jesus becomes the focal point. Why? Because Jesus was the breath of fresh air they had been hoping for. In a dead religious atmosphere, Jesus cut like a knife through that malaise. I love John chapter 15 when the Pharisees confront Jesus and they uh, are miffed because uh, the disciples don't um, wash their hands according to the tradition of the elders when they eat. And so they come to him and say, why is it that your disciples break the tradition of the elders and they don't wash their hands? And Jesus fired back and he said, why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition or your religion. You're holding so tightly to your religious expression. Don't you know there's more? Well, this crowd has that sense. They are interested in what Jesus has to say. They're interested in what Jesus might do because of what has been happening. And uh, we'll skip down to verse 19. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing? Look, the world has gone after him. What do they mean by that? They recognize what's happening. They recognize that people are attracted more and more 
to this Jesus that they want nothing to do with. And the crowds have been growing. In Mark chapter 2, we are told when Jesus spoke, it says, and the common people heard him gladly. It's one of my favorite little verses. Everybody could understand him. Everybody could get it. But notice what they do here in verse 13. They took branches of palm trees, went out to meet him, and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now, we've heard that year, uh, word for years. If you have attended church, you have heard the word Hosanna, typically on Palm Sunday. That's when we whip that baby out. Hosanna, Hosanna. We always make a big deal out of it. You know what it means? It means rescue us now. Save us now. Deliver us now. That's what they're crying out for. We need a savior. Save us. Do it now. Deliver us. Do it now. Now that's good, but these hosannas are going to be very short-lived because many of these very same people in this crowd in a few days are going to be the very ones who say, release Barabbas and kill this guy. Crucify him. The crowd will shout that out. The crowd here at this Passover. But they're crying out for a savior. They're crying out for deliverance. In their minds, they're not thinking he's going to die on a cross and deliver us from sin. They're hoping he's going to deliver them from Rome, that he'll be a political dictator who overthrows Rome. But Jesus is commanding all of the attention, all the hopes of the people, because Jesus is more appealing than religion. And I've noticed over the years, I've collected quotes that people who often will reject organized religion, and that seems to be a growing group, at the same time will admit that the person of Jesus is utterly compelling. The person of Jesus is compelling, religion not so much. And uh, I'll spare you many quotes, but let me give you a couple. Napoleon Bonaparte said, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself have founded great empires, but Jesus founded his empire upon love. And to this very day, millions would die for him. Here's a world ruler setting Jesus apart from every other political, religious, ambitious leader ever. And then there was H.G. Wells. Herbert George Wells was a historian and an author. He was not a believer. He's the guy that wrote that very famous work, War of the Worlds. He said, I am an historian. I am not a believer. But I must confess as a historian, that this, this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all of history. And what is angering the Pharisees is that Jesus is stealing the show. That people get it. People are more interested in what he has to offer than what they as a religious system have to offer. I grew up in a religious home. And uh, I thought because I was religious um, that that's all I needed. My religion, it was good. But it wasn't good enough. And it certainly wasn't the best. What we are offering... What we talk about, what we celebrate, what we mention quite frequently is not religion. It's a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And that's a world of difference. I never want you to think, oh, I'm, I'm going to go to that religious place. We are not a religious group of people. Follow me around for a day. You'll figure that out real quick. <laughs> I am not at all interested in religion. I'm very interested in Jesus. So Jesus is more appealing than religion. The second comparison 
Scripture is more reliable than opinion. Verse 14, then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now, everybody has some opinion about Jesus Christ. Might even be a good opinion. I've heard a lot of them through the years. The top few that I often hear are, oh, Jesus was a loving person. Jesus was an awesome teacher. Jesus was a good example. Jesus was a faithful healer. Some opinions are good. Others' opinions of Jesus are better, but they're not the best because they're not true. And what is better than somebody's opinion? The truth. The truth is better than somebody's opinion. There are many opinions, even in the Gospel of John, by the way. I took a sampling of them this week just to show you. Just in the Gospel of John alone, Three times we are told, then there was a division among the people because of him, because of Jesus. Jesus divided people. Jesus was like a, um, a, a tension, a lightning rod. He, he brought tension to the situation. He divided families, divided people. In John chapter 7, some people said he is a prophet. In John chapter 9, others said, this man is not from God. Others said he is a sinner Others in that same chapter said he's a prophet. In John chapter 10, the very next chapter, some were saying he has a demon and he's nuts. He's mad. He's crazy. Still others in the same chapter said this is the Christ. And then when they said that, the others said, well, he can't be the Christ because he's from Galilee. So there's many, many different opinions of who Jesus was just in a few chapters. Question, were any of those opinions right? Not really. I mean, they said he was a prophet. That's pretty close. Some said he was the Christ, but their idea of who and what the Christ was all about was not who he really was. But compare that to what we're reading here. Twice, in this little paragraph, John, the author, quotes scripture. In verse 13, he is drawing from, because the people are quoting it, their people are shouting out Hosanna, and uh, it is a quote directly out of Psalm 118, because the crowd, some of them at least, saw Jesus as the fulfillment of Psalm 18, the Messiah. That's why they shouted out and said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. They're quoting the scripture. Then notice in verse 15, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. The verse right before that says, it is written. Where is that written? Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, was a prophetic scripture announcing that, hey, when your king comes, you'll know it because he's going to be riding in on a donkey, which donkeys did in times of peace. So this Jesus coming in on a donkey to fulfill that scripture, also hearing the hosannas from Psalm 118, all of that was to reveal his identity. Now, what the scripture declares about him is more reliable than what anybody else thinks of him. What the Bible describes him to be is more reliable than what anybody else thinks him to be. Because God, God's truth, is not subject to man's opinion. You know, people talk about, well, my truth is this. And, and then they'll listen to you go, well, that's, that's your truth. 
No, we're not talking about your truth or my truth, but the truth, the truth. There is such a thing as objective, absolute truth. And this is why, this is important, this is why the scripture commends objective examination. It invites scrutiny. It invites that kind of examination in one particular area, and that is prophecy. This is what God says in Isaiah 41. He basically says, look, exhibit A, I can tell the future, can you? That's exhibit A. He uses prophecy as hard evidence that the scripture is true. Isaiah 41, present your case, set forth your arguments, bring in your idols to tell us what is going to happen. Tell us what the former things were so that we may consider them and know their final outcome. Or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what the future holds so that we may know you are God's. Walk up to a little statue and say, come on, spit it out. What's going to happen in a year, 10 years? God is sort of mocking their inability to do that. Enter Jesus Christ a thousand years after Isaiah, or at least several hundred years after Isaiah. Jesus uses the same principle saying, my ability to tell the future is the basis for you to believe. John 14, 29, now I have told you before it comes so that when it does come to pass, you may believe. In John chapter five, Jesus said, search the scriptures for in them you think that you have eternal life. But these are they which testify about me. The very Bible that you guys talk about all speak of me. I am the fulfillment of that. And this is all important stuff because basically when we are dealing with the person of Jesus Christ, he has three basic credentials that sets him apart from everyone else. Number one, his impact upon history, as already noted by uh, Napoleon and H.G. Wells. Number two, his resurrection from the dead. Nobody else pulled that off. And number three, prophecy. Prophecy. Of the 25 books that claim to be scripture, there's something absent in all of them except one. It's called prophecy. The ability to predict with detail and accuracy the future. There are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament made about Jesus' identity. This is why we do Bible study. The reason we do Bible study at every service is to get a clearer picture of Jesus Christ. To get a clearer picture of Jesus Christ. Without the Bible, we would all be sitting around giving our opinions to each other. That would be so boring. I want to know what God says. I want to know a word from heaven. That's why we studied the Bible, because Scripture is more reliable than opinion. Now, what happened on Palm Sunday does reveal the accuracy and reliability of the Scripture. And before, I have done this before. I'm not going to get into it now because of time. I would commend to you to go on our website uh, at calvarychurch.org or go to skipheitzig.com and and get the studies on the book of Daniel, where basically Daniel gives the exact day for Jesus to show up in Jerusalem from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, will be this length of time, 483 years, to compute it in today's 173,880 days. The commandment was given by Artaxerxes to restore and rebuild the temple, on March 14th, 445 BC, if you were to count that many days, you would arrive exactly on this day. This is why in Luke's rendering of the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, Jesus says to the crowd, if you would have only known in this, your day, the things that make for your peace, but they're hidden from your eyes. Therefore, your enemies are going to come down and they're going to surround you and dig a trench and destroy you and take every stone and dismantle it because, because you didn't know the time of your visitation. 
you should have known about this day. Daniel gave you the exact day. And he held them accountable. So I love that because I walk away going, how exact is God? Very exact. And because he is so exact and he is never late, he is always on time. Man, I can trust him with anything and everything. Well, when Jesus is doing this and as the people are saying this, look at verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things, look at this, were written about him and that they had done these things to him. That's how it works often. It's after the fact and we go, oh, I study my Bible and I learn a few more things. Now I get it. And I am to this day, after this many years of doing what I'm doing, I'm still totally amazed at the accuracy and reliability of Scripture. So Scripture is more reliable than opinion. And this is very important because everybody has an opinion. Well, you know, my opinion about Jesus, you know what? I don't really care about your opinion <laughs> because... When your opinion is as accurate as the Bible, then I'll care. If you can do that, then I'll care. Well, I think, well, I'm glad you think that, but this is who he really is. So, two things to compare. Jesus over religion, he is more appealing than religion. Scripture over opinion, scripture is more reliable than opinion. Third, and we'll close here, following is more important than observation. Now, let's take a closer look, briefly, but take a closer look. There are four separate groups of people that are represented in this story. And John, by the way, often does this. When he writes the Gospel of John, he will identify different people who listen or who watch and what their reaction is. So the first group are the disciples. Verse 16, they're mentioned. His disciples did not understand these things at first. Disciples were the 12 guys who followed him everywhere he went. For three and a half years, they have been at his side, listening to him, watching him. Those are his disciples. They will also be apostles. Second group are people in the crowd who were eyewitnesses when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in the previous chapter, just two miles from Jerusalem in Bethany. That's in verse 17. Therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead. They were there watching that, bore witness. So that's the second group. You've got the disciples, you have eyewitnesses to Lazarus' resurrection. The third group is in verse 18, and they are the people that heard about the resurrection from group number two, the eyewitnesses. Verse 18 says, for this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. So that's the third group. And then the fourth group watching this whole thing, they're the Pharisees. And uh, they're just bent out of shape. It's like, man, look at this guy. Everybody's following him. And they're in verse 19. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see, you're, not, you're accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now, I, I chuckle at this because their worst fear is coming true. Their worst, the worst fear of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish body of ruling elders, uh, is coming true. So uh, to explain that really quickly, go back one chapter. Just real quickly, go to chapter 11. Look at verse 45, John chapter 11. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary... And had seen the things Jesus did, believed in him. That's the resurrection of Lazarus. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what are we going to do? What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. Now, in the very next chapter, they're going, look at this guy. Everybody's following him. So it makes me chuckle a little bit. So we have four groups of people. 
four groups, but really only two categories. Category number one, observers. Category number two, followers, disciples. Some are watching, some are a little more engaged, some are a little more engaged. Disciples have been following Jesus and will continue to follow him to their martyrdom, to their death. So, watching is good, admiring him is better, following him is best. And that's what the disciples do. What is a disciple, you ask? The Greek word mathetes, it means a, a learner, a student. It's a technical term for followers of Jesus Christ. In the Jewish world, disciples were typically men who voluntarily sought after a rabbi and sought to emulate that rabbi's lifestyle, and they were called to a lifetime of work and service. So Jesus describes what a disciple is. And this is important for us who say, I follow Jesus. This is what Jesus said a, a disciple is. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Follow means, means walk the same road that I walk. So here's the question. Are you an observer? Are you an admirer? Or are you a follower? Are you an observer? You come to church, you observe worship, you watch Christians do their thing. Um, maybe you're at the next level. No, 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 I'm an admirer. You find it a positive atmosphere. It's pleasing. It makes you feel good. But the best level, the best, the best is being a follower. It's where you invite Jesus into your life, not once, but every single day you invite him to be at the center of your life. That's following him. It's what Mark Buchanan called a traveler versus a tourist. Mark Buchanan wrote a clever little book called My Church is Too Safe. My Church is Too Safe. And uh, he talks about a traveler versus a tourist. He said this, a traveler is a word that literally means one who travails. One who travails. That's a traveler. It, it originally meant somebody who will labor and suffer to immerse themselves in another culture, learn the language, eat the food, adopt the lifestyle, eats whatever is set before him, and is usually gone a long time. He's a travailer. But then he says there's a tourist. And the word tourist literally means one who goes in circles. <laughs> and he describes that. They pass through whatever, wherever place they're visiting. They pass through briefly. They sample the food. They buy souvenirs, but they go each night to their nice hotel room. And then they return home with pictures and T-shirt. <laughs> they're the tourists, not the, tra not the travailers. So four groups are watching. All of them are observing. There's really only one group that is in it for the long haul. Those are the disciples. Those are the followers. Some people love to study religion and read about Jesus. Everything short of following him. It's a good thing. That's a good thing. I'm studying about Jesus. That's a good thing. But listen, listen. A good thing can become a bad thing if it keeps you from the best thing. The best thing is to follow him. Walk the same road as him. Follow him every day of your life. That's the message of Palm Sunday. Father, thank you for the um, text that is laid out before us, the story as John described it. We love the fact that each of the Gospels tells the same story with the same exact salient points, but from a little bit different vantage point, including a little more or a little less information, depending on the nature of the intent of the author. But here we have, we have clear comparisons laid out. Jesus is just way more appealing than same old, same old religion. Scripture is far more reliable than somebody's even learned opinion. And following is more important than 
observation. Help us, Lord, to be followers, disciples, those who would deny self, take up cross, and follow after the Lord Jesus Christ, not as a spoke on our wheel, but as the very hub of life itself. And on this Palm Sunday, we recognize that there was a great crowd of people there, but most of them were not going to follow this Jesus on his terms, which meant death, burial, resurrection, and then a lifetime of following, spreading that message. They wanted deliverance from pain, they wanted deliverance from oppression, and they wanted it now. And Jesus did come to save, but not to save them from Rome, but to save them from sin. And Lord, you wanna do the same. You're still the same savior. And we cry out here, Hosanna, save now. But Lord, we're not talking about a political future. We're talking about the most important thing you could ever save us from, and that is from ourselves, from our own shortcomings, our own sin. And I, Lord, I just pray for anybody who might be with us who senses their need of a savior. The best thing that could happen to them, the best thing is for them to yield their life to Jesus and to say yes to the savior. So with our heads bowed, I just wanna ask you if you're here and uh, you've never given your life to Jesus, you've admired Jesus, you've studied Jesus, uh, but you're not really following him. Your life isn't conforming to him. I'm not asking you if you're perfect. I'm just asking you, are you a disciple? Really, a disciple, a follower? Not a religious person, a disciple. And I wanna ask you, are you willing to embrace Jesus as your savior personally, as a personal act of your will, whereby you are allowing his will in your life to call the shots? That's surrender, that's surrender. Or maybe I'm speaking to someone who once did that, but they're not doing it anymore. They've walked away from him. They're not living in obedience to him. You need to come back home and reaffirm that commitment. If either one of those describes you, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm gonna leave my eyes open so I can acknowledge you. If you are willing to put your faith in Jesus, to give your life to Jesus, to ask him to come in and be Lord of your life. If you're willing to do that, I want you to raise your hand up in the air and just keep it up in the air just for a moment so I can acknowledge you. God bless you right up here in the front. Anyone else? Raise it up so I can acknowledge you in the back. Thank you. And in the back again on my left, on my left right up front to my right. Anybody else? Anyone in the family room? Just raise that hand. Awesome. Father, we uh, thank you for these men and women, different backgrounds, different situations, all with the same need. Sensing that there's more to life than what they've experienced, wanting to come into a relationship with God and not just go through the motions of religion, but a real, saved, free relationship with the Savior. Thank you for them. Strengthen them as they make a commitment to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Would you stand, please, to your feet? Now, as we sing this final song, I... I'm gonna ask you to do something. If you raised your hand, and we're not doing this to embarrass you, we're doing this to encourage you. We wanna welcome you into God's family with open arms. We wanna say by our applause that you made the right decision. So if you raised your hand, I want you to get up from where you're standing. Say, excuse me if you're in the middle of a row, make it to the aisle and come right up here. And when you're all up here, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer to receive Christ and you. Come on, come on up right now.
artist, wisest thing you could ever do, what you're doing right here. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to pray this prayer out loud. I'd like you to pray it out loud after me. Say these words. Mean them from your heart. You're talking to God. Just say this. Lord, I give you my life. I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died on the cross. I believe he shed his blood for me. I believe he rose again. I turn from my sin. I turn to Jesus as my Savior. I want to follow him as my Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Can you see Coy over here? Come on, let's go follow Coy. If you come forward, we want to give you something. Come on. Come on, church. Let's make some noise for those who just said yes to Jesus. Just acknowledge his kingship in their lives. We are so excited for that. Hey, before you go, if you said that prayer online, we are so excited for the decision that you just made as well. Church, can we make some noise for all those who might have said that prayer online? If you said that prayer, would you just text the word LIFE, L-I-F-E, to 505 505- 509-5433. Those who came forward right now having an opportunity to hear about the next steps that they can take. That was a big first step, but as we all know, walking with God is about daily taking a step towards Him. We want to help those who just said that prayer do that, and not just here in person, but online. We want to help you take that next step. So make sure to text that number. We want to send you a Bible. We want to give you a few follow-up steps. Uh, hey, I want to let you know, for those of you who are here, if it is your first time today at Calvary. We are so excited that you came to join us. Church, can we make some noise for the first timers? We hope that you felt loved, that you felt cared for, that you enjoyed your time here at Calvary. We hope to see you again if you did not get to enjoy the VIP experience that starts in the parking lot. You have in your bulletin, they're at all the boxes, a red card that says next steps. We would love it if you would fill that card out. And after service, come bring it to one of our team members. If you do, we have an incredible gift we want to get in your hands as well. We want to make a donation in your honor to one of four incredible charities doing work around the world. So make sure to fill that out and give it to a team member. Uh, Hey, one more time, I want to remind you, next weekend, Easter services. Join us for sunrise. Join us for 9 or 11 o'clock. After the 11 o'clock service, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt for kids. It's going to be such a blast. We look forward to seeing you there. And of course, two services on Good Friday at noon and then at 6.30. So make plans to join us. But I challenge you as you launch out into this week, as we lead into Passion Week, remind yourself that Jesus is King, not just over the universe, but he's King of your life. So go out this week living your life that way, right? Living your life in light of the kingship, in light of the resurrection and the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you guys. Have a fantastic week. We'll see you next weekend.